Okay, hi guys, thanks for coming. It's a beautiful afternoon out there. So I appreciate y'all being here. Let me just tell you a little bit about my background and why you would wanna pay attention to what I have to say. Um, so I got an undergraduate degree and a master's degree in economics way back in the eighties. And then I worked for two and a half years as a state budget analyst and an economic analyst in a big agency in the state capital in Olympia, Washington, uh, state capital for Washington. Um, that was a health service ag agency, but I think it gives me some perspective on what might be going on in an agency like uh, the uh, HCD, Housing and Community Development, because something has gone badly off the rails there. Um, I then came to Berkeley, um, started out as an econ grad student, but more and more got interested in one of my first loves in life, which was the hard sciences. So I switched to being a staff member and had a 20 year career at the, uh, in the Berkeley, in not Berkeley, but the UC system, both at system wide headquarters in Oakland and at Berkeley. And I spent the last 11 years as a uh, science editor for the UC Berkeley College of Chemistry, generally considered to be the best in the world. And um, let me toot the College of Chemistry's horn here briefly. There have only been seven women uh, Nobel laureates in chemistry. 1911 was Marie Curie, 1935 was her daughter, 1964 was a British X-ray crystallographer named Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkins. Although most people think that Rosalind Franklin should have gotten that honor first, but she, she worked with Crick and Watson and she was the one who did the first studies that revealed the structure of DNA. Um, but she died before they could reconsider giving her a Nobel. And you don't, you, we don't give Nobel prizes posthumously. Um, there's a woman named Yona from 19, early 2000s, I believe, who worked on uh, the ribosome. And then three in a row um, in even years, 2018 is Francis Arnold, 2020 is Carol, um, is Doudna, Jennifer Doudna. And then last year, or this year, 2022, is Carolyn Bertozzi. And all three of those uh, women from the last, the last three Nobel laureates either were students or professors or both at the College of Chemistry at Berkeley. So, uh, you know, I just want to remind you that some things, you know, still go right in this, the state of California. It's, in some ways, it's pretty grim, but it's, you know, it's still an amazing place. So let's keep that in mind. Oh, so anyway, and then, oh, public service. I first started out on my local school board in 2002, was on the board for four years, and I did eight years as a city council member. And from 2012 to 2020, and I was termed out after that in my little city of Albany. And uh, my last pitch for my expertise is that as an avid cyclist, I have toured or hiked in 42 of the state's 58 counties, and I've driven my car through another 13, mostly along the I-5 corridor, and there's only three counties in the state that I have never visited. So if anybody in Sacramento tells you they can issue one-size-fits-all that covers this very diverse state, I think they're crazy. So Rick, we can go ahead and start the slides, please. Okay, so here we are, California Alliance of Local Elections. I just wanted to show you our logo. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, we can skip that one, I already did that one. So next slide, please. Okay, playing the housing numbers game. I'll get back to why, where that title comes from. How California's sixth cycle sets up cities to fail. Um, and I think you'll be persuaded that that is the case by the time I'm done. So next slide, please. All right, here's what we're gonna cover. Um, what is RENA? We'll talk a little bit about that. And what are the issues? And that will include a discussion of two very critical bills, SB 35 from 2017 and uh, SB 828 from the following year. 
we'll talk a little bit about the arena audit and then we'll get into what I really want to focus on for now is the HCD's 2022 statewide housing plan. We finally now have numbers for the whole state. And then in doing research for this, I came across a very interesting exit interview of former Governor Jerry Brown, and he gave us some parting thoughts on housing, which I think you'll find interesting. So I want to go fast because I th think the new interesting stuff is then loaded in the back. And then I'm going to, this will probably take 30 minutes, and then I hope we have a half hour for questions. So next slide, please. Okay, RENA is the regional, looks, I have a typo in that title. It uh, is the Regional Housing Needs Assessment Process, RHNA. You know, it was first developed in 1969 as a way for cities to plan. It was just a planning process, the housing needs for the community, and it breaks down the housing needs by various income categories. Um, and this, these RENA targets are then integrated into what's called the housing element. And many of us now are, are working on the housing elements here in Northern California. Southern California was about a year ahead of us, so they're much further along in the process. And we are now at the beginning of the sixth eight-year RENA cycle, which is turning out to be vastly different than the fifth year or the fifth RENA cycle. Next slide, please. Uh, that's the same. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Now, here's the bad news. RENA never worked. And that was clear by 2003. The Public Policy Institute of California did a, an important study, California's Housing Element Law, the issue of local noncompliance. And the, the takeaway messages from this study, and it's still available on the web, is that compliance with RENA had no effect on how much housing was built. Developers typically exceeded the RENA targets for market rate housing, but they chose their own sites. And it's, you know, they're free to do that. But on the other hand, cities almost never met their affordable housing targets, especially after the end of uh, redevelopment money, the program that Jerry Brown killed in the Great Recession. So the, the affordable housing targets were never met. But the problem has gotten worse because income inequality has been growing in this country ever since I was an econ undergrad in the early 1980s. We began to be aware of it then and it's gotten worse. And in most respects, it, the, uh, the COVID epidemic made it even worse. Um, but we'll see how all that plays out because you know, with interest rates getting higher, things are beginning to crash. Um, we, we are, Back to this, can you advance the slide back to where it was, please? Thank you. RENA is broken. Anyone I know who works closely with RENA, um, including a very good uh, consultant who has done very good work on RENA, just says the process is broken. Uh, but unfortunately, we're gonna have to deal with this broken process and it's going to be a problem. So next slide, please. Okay, 2017 was the year RENA was weaponized. There was a package of housing bills that uh, Jerry Brown signed, there was 15. Probably the most prominent was SB 35. That was a bill that said, if cities midway through the RENA cycle fail to have met um, their goals for developing housing, then for the rest of the, the arena cycle, project approvals are ministerial in cities. Ministerial means by right. If a developer applies for an approval, the city must approve it without public comment or oversight, no <clears throat> notification. <clears throat> and the only uh, criteria that the cities can set is existing objective standards. In many cities, because they relied on the planning and zoning commissions to uh, look at projects and approve them or not, uh, don't have well-developed sets of objective standards. So my one pitch is that if you don't have good sets of objective standards, we've got about four years to scramble and get some in place. Otherwise, things will get ugly. Um, next slide, please. Okay, there we go. Now, 
SB 35 contains a poison pill that a lot of people did not understand at the time, although the League of California has pointed it out in their veto letter to Governor Brown. And they said that a better bill would require the trigger for ministerial approval of housing projects to be based on the number of entitled and approved applications, a process that a local agency actually controls, rather than building permits, which is a, a develop which a developer controls and will not pull until, until they are ready to construct a project. So in other words, you know, a city can issue approvals and entitlements, and then they have a fairly long shelf life, depending on the cities. It can be a year or two. Um, developers don't necessarily have to pull permits right away. They can just bank those approvals and wait until they're ready to start projects. So it's a little bit unfair. The League of California Cities, also known now as Cal Cities, said at the time that we will basic cities will basically be punished by losing control of development and going to ministerial processes if the developers don't pull permits, even though cities don't control the developers. Developers have all sorts of constraints and reasons why they may or may not pull permits. Um, but this fell in deaf ears and Jerry Brown went ahead and signed SB 35 as part of that 15 bill package in 2017. Now the trouble is it creates a little bit of a perverse incentive for developers because if they're sort of getting close to the deadline, they might be thinking about pulling a permit and starting, they might wanna wait until after the midpoint of the arena cycle because if the city is failing, if they hesitate and then the cities have to switch to ministerial processes, then the developer has much more latitude about what they can do. So, you know, this perverse incentive problem is something we'll probably see come up in four years. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there was SB 35 contained a poison pill, but it wasn't really activated. And that's because SB 35, um, only does ministerial approvals within income groups. So for example, if you don't, if you fail to meet your targets for affordable housing, which virtually everyone does, okay. SB 35 triggers ministerial approvals for affordable housing. But the that was not a big problem because there was never enough money to do affordable housing anyway. Affordable, the goals for affordable housing were never um, met or rarely were met but developers didn't have enough money to do them anyway. So it was kind of a moot point. On the other hand, for market rate housing, cities typically met or exceeded their goals for market rate housing. So SB 35 was not invoked for market rate housing. So Scott Wiener, the Senator from San Francisco, who worked with the Bay Area Council and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group on these bills, needed some way to jack up the arena targets for market rate housing to unrealistic levels, guaranteeing that most cities then would fail to meet the targets and then the ministerial approval aspects of SB 35 would be triggered. SB 35 did just that. It allowed HCD to make some, I think fairly ridiculous, sloppy and redundant adjustments to the arena goals. That bill was sponsored by the Bay Area Council and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. And the Barrier Council in one of its newsletters gloated how successful the bill was because it really jacked up the requirements for market rate housing. And the title of their little announcement in their newsletter was playing the, uh, playing the housing market game. So my, uh, yeah, playing, I'm sorry, playing the housing numbers game. So my title for this talk actually was the headline for that article by the Bay Area Council. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, but there's an, there's another aspect of this too, and that is in order to meet inflated RENA targets, cities have to upzone and up, sometimes upzone quite a lot. For example, Berkeley, my backyard fence is the Berkeley border here in Little Old Albany. Um, had their targets tripled just about in between the fifth cycle and the sixth cycle. So cities will be in the next, you know, if you're not doing it already, you'll be frantically trying to upzone some of your neighborhoods in order to meet the planning goals of the arena process. 
this is very advantageous to developers who own property and to landowners who have undeveloped property because by making the development envelope bigger, by having to allow for more height or smaller setbacks um, or higher floor area ratios, you increase the developable envelope of the building, the amount of say apartments that you can get, you can cram into the building and that new more lenient requirements automatically in, increases the value of your land. So up, up zoning creates windfall increases in property values, especially for undeveloped commercial and multifamily residential lots. And there has, this is an old, old problem. And there's, it's been around literally for centuries and cities have sometimes responded which, with what's called value recapture. But again, if your city is not familiar with and comfortable with, with means for doing value recapture on these newly up zone properties, that's something that you should really explore. Um, next, please. So this is um, sort of old data now. For those of you who are familiar with Gab Layton's work with the Embarcadero Institute, this is what she discovered for the four main planning regions, which are basically the Bay Area, Southern California, including Imperial County, Sacramento, and San Diego. That's 82% of the state population. The rest of the state takes a while to weigh in because there's lots of small counties and counties with that are not incorporated, have no incorporated cities in them like Alpine County. And it takes a lot of time to get all those in there, but they're all in there now. So we now have new numbers about the whole state instead of just the four main regions. Um, but the main point still remains that the targets are ridiculous, that they're designed to trigger ministerial approvals by setting up cities to fail. And given the interest rate and the, you know, the shutdown in housing production, it's even more likely that cities are going to set are you know are being set up to fail and will fail in four years. Next slide, please. Now, Cali played a role in persuading State Senator Steve Glazer, who is now turned out, that this was a problem. So Steve Glazer, who I think is a real straight shooter, he's the former mayor of Orinda and uh, is a rep from, was a senator from Contra Costa, um, requested an emergency audit of the, the RENA process. And in response to Glazer's request, in, um, and I'll say the state auditor's office turned this around pretty quickly. In March, 2022, Michael S. Tilden, the acting California state auditor, issued a critique of RENA. And here's what he says. Overall, our audit determined that HCD does not ensure that it its needs assessments are accurate and adequately supported. This insufficient oversight and lack of support for its considerations risks eroding public confidence that HCD is informing local governments of the appropriate amount of housing they will need. Next slide, please. One more. There we go. But there is a catch, no surprise. The state auditor has no power of enforcement. Um, there are no, the state auditor does not have a police force, uh, you know, a police force that will go out and arrest the heads of HCD if, if they ignore the criticisms of, in the audit. So HCD has a history of not paying very close attention to uh, the audit reports. And this is true even though the auditor concluded that HCD must improve its processes to ensure that communities can adequately plan for housing. Now, the auditor's report did make several recommendations um, and there's with timelines for getting them completed, HCD kind of dragged its feet and they are now starting to comply. Um, but it doesn't mean they're gonna do a good job of complying and it doesn't mean they're gonna have public processes. So even though HCD is beginning to address the auditor's recommendations, I think it's important that citizens and cities, you know, keep tabs with what's going on because otherwise I think the auditor's recommendations will go nowhere. Uh, next slide, please. One more. There, okay, I, this is important. I know right now, 
cities are really scrambling to get their um, housing elements completed and getting them certified. And then I think there's a sense that, oh, we can relax after that. Uh, but no, what happens when you get a certified housing element is you're just jump, jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. Um, that's because those outrageous uh, targets that SB 828 allowed are still looming. So in four years, you know, it's like there's a time bomb sitting underneath your city. And in four years, because the targets are so outrageous and we're set up to make you fail, you are going to fail to meet the requirements of SB 35. And then the processing of applications for development in your city will become ministerial. And this is almost a foregone conclusion. I mean, there might be some cities that escape this, but not very many will. Um, so you need, for those of you who are uh, members of city councils or planning staff or city attorneys, you know, I feel like a Cassandra telling this to people, but it's like, that time bomb is going to explode and explode in four years, and you cannot be too complacent about it. If nothing else, you can try to create some objective standards to try to uh, you know, shape how these projects go. But it's it's going to be tough. Um, so you can fight back. There's a two pronged approach. One would be to support the state auditor's work. But also consider become, becoming one of the play, plaintiffs in the HCD Rena lawsuit. And I, I talked to the, the attorney family just a couple of days ago who's working on this lawsuit. And, you know, it's coming together, it's coming into shape. Uh, I've heard concerns from her that I've heard from, you know, planners and other people in local city governments. Uh, something has gone wrong at HCD, and we need to figure out what it is and how to cope with it. So, next slide, please. There we go. All right, the statewide housing plan. Hang on to your hats because we're heading down the rabbit hole. Um, remember what Alice said, or what the Red Queen said in Alice in Wonderland. Well, sometimes I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Well, guess what? That seems to be how the management at HCD behaves. They believe many impossible things. So let's explore this rabbit hole. Next slide, please. Okay, so remember I said that HCD has now gathered all the data statewide and has issued what it calls a 2022 statewide housing plan. And what I'm gonna to refer to today is the fairly simple PDF version of it because it, you can quote page numbers and you can look at the graphs. Um, there is a very pretty um, interface for it that is also online and it's, you know, it's one of those very expensive things that um, uses a lot of flashy, um web stuff and um it's hard to reference that though so i for what follows i'm referring to the pdf version of the 2022 statewide housing plan um the numbers are so absurd that no analyst could take them seriously um, and so what's going on part of what's going on i think is that the rena goals have been politicized to please governor newsom who remember the heads of the agencies um, report to the governor. They don't report to the legislature. The governor basically runs the agencies. It's similar to federal level where the president has his cabinet and the cabinet are all the leaders of all the federal agencies. Um, so the arena goals have been politicized to please Governor Newsom, who has staked his political future on solving California's housing affordability problem. But that's a pretty tall order. It's an especially tall order to do it in two years. And it's a problem that his predecessor, Jerry Brown, felt that the state could not solve. So next slide, please. OK, here's the one. This is a picture of the warm, fuzzy interface for the 2022 statewide housing plan. And like I like the joke, and behind this warm, fuzzy interface is some pretty warm, fuzzy mathematics. Um, next slide, please.
Okay, so remember, as you'll see on, on the graph, the plan now calls for the statewide arena goals call for 2.5 million housing units to be built in the next eight years, 2.5 million, and fully 1 million of those have to be deeply affordable. That is affordable for people at the very low and low income levels. And these numbers are impossible. So for example, um, a good rule of thumb for what it costs to build this deeply affordable housing is $750,000 a housing unit. So obviously if you have to build a million units, you need to find $750 billion. Now, you might be able to get that down a little bit if you include some inclusionary housing, but I'll explain in a second why that's not going to get you very far. Um, but let's just say hypothetically, okay, let me let me put this in some perspective for you. Let's say you could somehow use an inclusionary housing, and typically that's the inclusionary housing rate is 15 or 20 percent in cities. Um, let's say you could get your, your number down to $600 billion. Okay, what is $600 billion compared to the state budget, for example? Well, if you look at the whole state budget, not just the, uh, both the, okay, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the words, but there's two pieces to the budget. There is a uh, dedicated funding and the general fund balance. So the, the dedicated stuff uh, you typically don't see, but if you put it together with a general fund, the state's, budget right now is $300 billion. So you understand, even if you could chop this number down a little bit, the amount of funding we would need to meet the affordable housing goals in the state of California over the next eight years is twice the size of the full discretionary and restricted state budget. And the, we aren't going to find that much money. Um, now, briefly, there's another problem, and that is the criteria for density bonus law was loosened up in 2021. And what you're seeing now is a lot of big projects, big apartment housing projects, where only 10% of the units are affordable. And I'll give you a quick example. Let's say you permitted a 100 unit building and you had a 15% inclusionary housing standard. Therefore, you'd have 150 units in that building. That would not meet your 15% criteria. But now under density bonus law, if all of those units are for very low income residents, you get a 50% density bonus, which means instead of just having 100 units in your building, you can now have 150 units in your building, a 50% bonus. Well. But if you have a building with 150 units and only 150 affordable housing units, your effective inclusionary housing rate has dropped to 10%. So we are now seeing projects out there and both in my town and uh, Oakland and some in Southern California, where the amount of affordable housing required is actually significantly lower than our city's own density bonus standards. Um, Okay, so next slide is a graph, and I see that slide. And I will say there's something strange going on with this analysis because the rhetoric, which I think was written for the honchos at HCD, is pretty much contradicted by the graphs, which I'm assuming were put in place and developed by the staff. So there's sort of a funny tension there where you look at the graph and you go, oh man, we have a problem. And then you read the rhetoric and they're like ships passing in the night. But this is a graph that explains the difference between the fifth cycle you know, standards or goals on the left and the sixth cycle ones on the right. So now we're, so it was 1.2 million homes back in the fifth cycle. And interestingly enough, even though California's population has actually declined in the last few years, the goals for the sixth cycle are more than doubled statewide. So they're, the, the two little colored bars on the bottom, the gray one and on the very bottom, that's sort of a beige color, that adds up to about a million. And then the top two bars, the light blue and the dark blue bars add up to 1.5 million. So 
these goals are pretty crazy. And I'll explain to you why in the next slide. Okay, so what's 2.5 million housing units over eight years? That is 312,500 units annually for eight years. Now that level of building in the state of California only occurred in one year since 1986, or since 1980, and that year was 1986. Now after the Great Recession of 2008, the housing market in this state collapsed and along with it, the building industry and its workforce. So currently, California produces a little more than 100,000 housing units annually. So what HCD says we're going to do is we're going to start from where we're at now, and we're going to triple our level of housing output very quickly to a level that we only ever achieved in the state of California in one year. And then we're going to do that for eight years in a, in a row, which has never occurred in the state's history. So can we see the next slide, please? There. And then someone on the HCD staff was thoughtful enough to include this chart. So if you look, you'll see on this chart, it's, it's divided into two parts. The dark blue are single family structures and the, the beige green color is units in multifamily structures. It's not buildings, it's the number of units in apartment buildings. So, and if you see on the left, the, the biggest peak was 1986. And there is a line that travels just below that peak that says units needed. And so you can see what the gap has been for the last several years. We're nowhere near achieving that many units. And the bad news, is that those dark blue bars, now that uh, the interest rates have risen, single family building has already collapsed. And so these blue bars, instead of going up, the way HCD would tell us they would like them to do, they're gonna go down. It's a little unclear now what's gonna happen to uh, apartment construction, but we can talk about that in, in the questions. I'd be curious to, to hear what, some of you folks are hearing. Anyway, look, so, so HCD is telling us, see that one really tall bar that goes back, back to 1986. They'll say, ignore all this history and how little housing we've produced in the last several years. We're gonna produce housing at the height of that bar from 1986, and we're gonna do it for eight years in a row. And that's not just not gonna happen. And they know it, and we've talked to people in, in you know, some of the, the building industry people that we've had them on Cali, and they told us the same thing, that they didn't think these goals were realistic. So next slide, please. All right, and this one needs a little bit of explanation. You know, I taught economics for years when I was a grad student and an acting instructor at UC Berkeley. And really early on in an Econ 1 course, you make a distinction between a market economy, a decentralized market economy, like for the most part we have in America, and a command economy where the state owns the means of production and owns most of the property. You know, like the old Soviet Union, for example, there's fewer command economies around than there used to be. Um, so HCD seems to be confused about this and that sometimes they very much talk about them and you know the importance of, of our market forces and letting developers use the market to build more housing, but then they kind of switch gears and say, and oh, by the way, here are not just planning targets, but production targets for cities. And you know, and you don't do cities in a market rate economy cannot be commanded to build stuff because we don't control the means of production. You know, the old Soviet Union, the state owned the means of production, but the means of production in a market economy are in private hands and are very diffusely run and spread out. So, um, and the reality is cities don't control developers. 
there is, as I've said many times, there is no gun cities can hold to property owners and developers' heads to force them to build. This is not the old Soviet Union. But the HCD now says that the arena goals are a production plan, not just a planning process. And real briefly, if you go back and read the League of California Cities veto request for SB 828, they make this point. They said, there's a problem with this bill and that arena was set up to be a planning process, not a production process, but the language of, of SB 828 suggests that this is gonna become production goals. Um, and you know, this is, we don't have five-year plans like we used, like the Soviet Union used to have, but HCD is on one hand saying, oh, the market rules and you know, the private sector is gonna solve our housing affordability problem. And also at the same time, they're saying, and we're gonna do an eight year plans and we're going to require certain levels of production and cities are responsible for that. You know, this is a huge contradiction. So next slide, please. And again, the staff at HCD provided us with a very nice graph that explains what the issues are here. <clears throat> so the far left blue bar, the tallest one, is the previous housing need under the, the fifth arena cycle. And it turns out that cities pretty much did their job. They zoned for enough capacity to, to meet those targets within about 3%. But then when it comes to units permitted, and remember, it's developers who pull permits. And, and this is was the objection with SB 35. When you look at the permits that the developers pulled, there's a huge drop off. Um, the number of units permitted doesn't come anywhere close to the goals or the zone capacity. Now, part of that is due to the fact that there's not any more, enough money to do affordable housing. And that's to a large extent beyond the control of the developers. But developers develop if they can make a profit. And if something happens be, that be, because of forces often beyond their control and they can't make a profit, it could be a labor shortage or interest rates change or there's a shortage of materials, any number of things which are controlled neither by developers or cities, then they aren't gonna pull permits for projects they don't think they can build profitably. And finally, but there's a drop, even when developers pull permits, they sometimes don't build those units. So there's a, a drop there as well. So remember the, the point is basically these two short bars on the right, are sort of downstream in the pipeline beyond the control of cities. Cities pretty much do their job. I think they produce approvals and entitlements, but something happens after that beyond the control of cities. And you'll notice that the, if you look at the, the original target goal of about 1.2 million, the final amount of housing that gets built is less than half that. So the attrition rate is over 50% in this process. Uh, so again, you know, the, the process doesn't really work. So um, next slide, please. Okay, but here's the catch. This now is, is um, text that I took straight from the 2022 uh, housing plan, statewide housing plan. So here we go. More than just being a high number or an aspirational goal, the new housing need arena target is a legal obligation that cities and counties must abide by, a legal obligation. The state helps cities and counties meet this goal through a combination of funding for housing, planning and implementation activities, education and technical assistance. While education and technical assistance is always the first step in the state's accountability efforts, the state holds jurisdictions accountable for their housing obligations and compliance with state laws. And the second piece is, through the implementation of a number of meaningful accountability reforms passed by the legislature and signed by the governor in recent years, California's 2.5 million unit target is no longer a paper exercise. It is an expectation for the zoning, permitting, and construction of new housing units. So HCD is telling cities you're responsible for construction of new units, even though that's not under your control. And here's my analogy. Let's say the legislature was really worried about the drought. And the legislature passed a law that said, okay, city councils, 
you are going to be required to do rain dances in order to make it rain. And when, let's say, even if the cities obliged and did rain dances and the rain didn't happen, you know, the cities would say, but this was a crazy exercise because we don't control the weather. So in that example, would it be fair to have HCD punish cities because the weather didn't change and it didn't rain. Now, I suggest if the cities in that example did that, I'm mean, sorry, if HCD did that, that would be pretty legally questionable. I mean, at, at one point, can HCD punish cities by, and it's not just by ministerial processes, it's by withholding other types of funding. Um, it's kind of a long laundry list of things they threaten to do. At what point is it no longer legal to punish cities because they didn't control something that they cannot control? Cities can't control the weather. Um, but you know what? Cities don't control developers either, not in a market-based economy. So that's a big problem and it's a big contradiction. And But it's one that unless something changes, we're gonna have to live with it. So next slide, please. All right, where do we go from here? This is sort of my, you know, age of dreams or desires. The RENA process needs to be abandoned. It doesn't work. It sm even small cities spend hundreds of thousands of dollars with consultants and of staff time producing these documents every eight years. And it's been pretty clear ever since the PPIC report in 2003 that it doesn't really accomplish much. And I think if you did any kind of reasonable um, cost-benefit analysis, RENA would fail that cost-benefit analysis. Now, <coughs> the attorney, Pam Lee, um, is, is working on lawsuits with HCD. And one of them, there may be a RENA lawsuit that could help speed its demise. And I think cities are going to have to step up and get involved in that lawsuit. And cities, I think, have very little to lose. Um, and my next point is the legislature passes hundreds of hundreds. They've passed about, you know, low hundreds number of housing bills in the last several years. And they aren't going to work because you can't tinker with the car capitalist market economy along the edges. And and move how the heart, housing market works. The housing market is too big. It's much bigger and involves much more flows of capital than what the state can match. And the private sector is not capable of solving our affordable housing problems. Uh, they can't make enough money to do it. And frankly, most market rate developers aren't even interested. So if the public wants affordable housing for those who need it, the public sector needs to figure out a cost-effective way to provide it. Because right now, we don't have a cost-effective way to provide it. Most of the funding sources, I'm sorry, let me back up. I can give you an example. We've worked with a very good um, nonprofit provider here in Albany to do a 40-unit uh, project. Sorry, 60-unit project, $40 million. And it's taken them four years just because of the bureaucracy to corral the necessary funding. So four years to get the funding done, they haven't even broken ground yet. Um, that's pretty typical. You know, this process is incredibly time consuming. It's incredibly bureaucratic. It wastes a lot of money and the public sector needs to do better, but it's still going to cost a lot of money. The missing ingredient is money. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, now, just you think, in case you think I'm out of my mind, um, I found a very interesting exit interview with Jerry Brown when he left office. And I've got six quotes from him. And I'm going to read them to you to just let you know that there used to be an adult in the governor's mansion. and He understood the issues, unlike the current guy, Gavin Newsom, who I think, frankly, is trying to beat up on cities and pin the blame on us. So when he runs for president in two, two, two more years, 
he'll have someone to blame. Um, and maybe he thinks he can actually get someone somewhere in two years, we'll see. So Jerry Brown said, just before he left office in an interview with KQED, well, capitalism is not a perfect system. Capitalism responds to incentives, to human desire, to restlessness, and even to put it more bluntly, greed. So we're about 2.8 trillion right now. California is the fifth largest economy in the world, and that's nuts. This completely overshadows state government activity. With all these rich kids making millions of dollars in Silicon Valley, they're bidding up the price of real estate. Of course, this is happening in Boston and New York, as well as London and Paris. Next slide. Three more quotes and we're done. Um, that's the same slide. One more. There we go. And Governor Brown continued, we've done quite a lot for what the state can do, but there's a lot of resistance to changes to density in neighborhoods that don't want density. In many ways, I don't blame them. I don't think you can mandate lower prices because people want value in their homes. I don't think you can build housing and pay for it by taxing hard-pressed middle-class people, among others, to pay for it. So I'd say this remains an issue and a topic that I know people will address. But if you wanna come back and talk to me in four more years, I assure you we're going to have the same problems that we have today. Okay, so I, let's, let's go. One last slide, just briefly. This is some useful links. Um, I make hope that somebody can put these into chat and uh, and it just was just a lot of background stuff uh, on various aspects of what I talked about. The state auditor's report, another presentation along with Pam Lee, who you can listen to. Pam Lee is the attorney who's doing some of the lawsuits against HCD at Catalyst for Change. Uh, the PDF version of the HCD's housing for all report. It's huge, it's about 60 megs. So you need to download it yourself. Uh, you can't really uh, attach it as an attachment to an email very successfully. And this is an, an, my original article at the top from my old city council blog, um, which still has that article. And I'm done. Thank you for your patience. Oh my God, that took too, too much time. But uh, so let's do some questions. Uh, 